Okay. Um, hello and uh, welcome, everyone. My, uh, my name is Eric Neumann. I'm the head of the Geography and Environment Department. It's a great pleasure to uh, introduce tonight's event. Uh, the event is really to celebrate um, the launch of the International Handbook of Gender uh, and, and Poverty, which uh, really has been uh, initially conceived by and then, of course, edited by our very own uh, Sylvia Chant, uh, who is over there and who is professor of uh, development geography. Now, Sylvia has reprimanded me already a little bit for not having read yet the entire book. Um, <laughs> but I should probably state in my defense, it's 700 pages long. It has 100 odd chapters and uh, sort of commensurate with its intellectual importance. Uh, it's physically rather heavy, uh, so heavy that I barely uh, venture to take it out of, out of my office. Well, it, it is a truly a, a, a great achievement, I think, this book. It's an outstanding uh, uh, book, and I'm uh, really great uh, that we have this event tonight to, to celebrate um, the launch. Now, we have the, the usual uh, suspects here, students, uh, staff, uh, members of the public, um, but we also have several representatives from development organizations and, and NGOs, uh, more unusually, Still, we have uh, 50 or so of the, of the book's uh, 125 contributors here. And I think we have about the entire Sylvia Chant clan here as well. Uh, I understand we have uh, her parents. Uh, we have two sisters uh, with their husbands. And of course, we have Sylvia's darling husband, Chris, uh, here. Uh, as well, so a particularly warm welcome to our special guest. Now, tell me a little, let me tell you a little bit about what will happen uh, tonight. Uh, Claire Hemmings, the director of the Gender Institute, will say a little bit on the on the on the book and Sylvia's role in it as the editor uh, of it. Sylvia herself will then introduce our three panelists. So, in the interest of time, I won't say anything in addition on our three distinguished uh, speakers, leaving that to um, Sylvia herself. The panelists will speak for about 20 minutes each, which should leave us a little bit of time for a question and answer session afterwards. So, uh, at the end of uh, the event here, we also have a uh, reception in the atrium, which is really just around the corner. So if, uh, sort of rather like myself, you're one of those uh, you know, sad human beings who don't have plans for a Friday night in London, uh, then you know, feel most welcome uh, to linger around and have some drinks and canapes at our expense. Um, talking about expenses, uh, I should probably acknowledge that uh, the event tonight and the reception in particular has been uh, made possible by the generous financial contribution of my own department, Geography and Environment, uh, the Gender Institute, uh, the LSE's annual fund, and also the publisher, um, Edward Elgar. So thank you very much um, for that. Lastly, uh, when you leave and if you go out and you uh, wish to, to buy uh, a copy of, of the book, uh, then you can uh, do so at a, at a great discount outside. And I mean a great discount. <laughs> this book, believe it or not, costs 175 quid. That's sort of a quarter of my monthly salary, <laughs> roughly. Um, but, it, uh, but today, and today only, if you buy it uh, outside at the, uh, at the stand outside, you can get it for a whopping 35 pounds. If that's not a bargain, I don't know what is. So without further ado, over to my colleague, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And um, I think, actually, though, what you fail to realize is that the, uh, uh, the reception in the atrium is the London event, and we're having to turn people away from it. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Sylvia Chant, the editor of the International Handbook of Gender and Poverty, the launch of which is the occasion for us all getting together to today and for the reception this evening. It sounds so straightforward putting it like that, but when you look at this book, as uh, Eric showed us. It's an extraordinary feat of communication and endurance. 104 entries from emerging and senior scholars, 
from different parts of the world, many of, who, of whom are here today to celebrate with us. The handbook represents a range of disciplinary perspectives and concerns with methodology, conceptual framing, and political and policy implications. And it's quite simply the definitive text on gender and poverty internationally. We hope as many of you as possible will stay and come and toast uh, the book at the launch after the event. For anyone who knows Sylvia, of course, this achievement won't come as any surprise. In addition to the handbook, Sylvia has published eight co-authored and four single-authored books in the last 20 years, more than the collective output of most small or large departments. <laughs> She's been a leading light and uncompromising presence in her field, insisting on the importance of putting women or gender front and center in concerns with poverty, migration, and housing, well before gender mainstreaming became fashionable as part of economic development. She is a major draw and inspiration for students at LSE and a source of ongoing support and advice for colleagues who she treats incredibly generously. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sylvia Chant and the panel. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Claire and Eric, for your opening remarks. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone here, ranging from family and friends to handbook contributors to colleagues and students and to all those who've come from um, organisations such as the ODI, DFID, Oxfam and the Levy Hume Trust. I'm also especially touched by the fact that some of you have travelled not only from outer London and outside London, but from as far away as Germany, Sweden, Mexico, the USA, and Japan. It was very distressing this morning uh, to wake up to the news of the disaster, um, but I want to underline how happy I am to have people from so many parts of the world. This is a truly international event. I would also like to extend my thanks to people within the LSE for their support, not only to Eric and Claire as respective heads of my home department and affiliate institute, but also to Hazel Johnson, James D. Lee, and Jenny Bridol. As I started to go into panic mode about two or three weeks ago, I'm now in hyper panic mode. Um, it was always a comfort to know that I was surrounded by people on whom I could utterly rely. And as for the handbook itself, aside from my erstwhile contributors, Lee Major, Rolf Kinnear, Alice Evans, and the staff at Edward Elgar uh, deserve special mention. And thanks too to Amy Mollett for setting up an LSE politics blog um, around this event. And coming now to the main point of my introduction, I cannot underline strongly enough what a great personal and professional pleasure it is to have three such distinguished panel speakers on the panel this evening. I have known all three of our speakers for a long time. Not only have they made a major impression on me since the very early days of my career, but they've also honoured me with contributions to the International Handbook. Professor Diane Elson as a chapter writer, and Professors Nancy Folbray and Maxime Molyneux as readers and endorsers. My students here tonight will recognise all three names as amongst the most prominent in the gender and development, or as we call it, GAD, field. Indeed, their writings are all over my reading lists. I am also aware that our speakers are well known to many others in the audience, not least the 50 or so contributors to the handbook who have managed to find time in their busy schedules to be present this evening and indeed this afternoon. That most of you already know the distinctions of our speakers makes my necessarily few minutes of introduction easier, at least in principle. In practice, however, it's extremely difficult to summarise the achievements and accolades of each panellist in a few words. So please bear with me while I do my best to provide concise tip of the iceberg introductions in which I've chosen to emphasize aspects which have made a particular impression on me during the last 30 years. Starting with Diane, Professor Diane Elson has not only been a leading figure in the field for more than three decades, but could perhaps, like a fellow panelist, be better described as a pioneer. When I started my PhD on gender and housing in Mexico in 1981 at University College, the GAD field was really in its infancy, in the rather exciting process of being staked out. 
However, even during this comparatively gender-blind period, I believe that's a term developed by Caroline Moser, who's in the audience tonight, Diane was someone whose name was already familiar to anyone and everyone with an interest in this new and unfolding area. I think one of the first things I read of Diane's was her now classic paper, written with Professor Ruth Pearson, who's here in the audience tonight, in a journal called Signs in 1981. It was called Nimble Fingers Make Cheap Workers. Any student of mine? Feminist, Feminist Review. Was it Feminist Review? Well, there you go. Um, so I apologise to my students right now, and uh, no wonder you couldn't find it. So, um, OK, but it's been republished in so many special journal uh, editions and books that it's sometimes hard to find the original source. I'm probably going to make other boo-boos as we go on. Anyway, this uh, was and continues to be probably, probably the most incisive account ever of women's recruitment and export industry. From there on in, Diane continued to break new ground with her work on gender and structural adjustment in the 1980s and on gender responsive budgeting into the 90s and 2000s. Diane's research trajectory is very well known to me, not least because I was given the honour of writing an appreciation of her work for David Simon's book, 50 Key Thinkers um, in Development. Latterly, Diane has been exploring the massively important topic of the gender implications of the current global economic crisis, which is the theme she'll be speaking to tonight. While Diane's latest permanent position has been as Professor of Sociology at Essex, she has held a string of visiting chairs elsewhere and has advised numerous international agencies, including UNIFEM and UNDP. Diane was a member of the UN Millennium Task Force on Gender Equality and Vice President of the International Association of Economics. Currently, Diane is Chair of the UK Women's Budget Group. I can't think of anyone better placed to talk about gender and the global economic crisis, and I'm deeply grateful to Diane for agreeing to join our panel. I'm also extremely grateful to my second speaker, Professor Nancy Fulbright. Nancy has come all the way from the University of Massachusetts, where she has long held a chair in economics. Again, Nancy has been a beacon to feminist economists and to gender scholars more generally for her trailblazing work on the interface of feminist theory and political economy, the economics of the family, and on unpaid care work. Like her fellow speakers, Nancy is extensively published academically, but somehow also manages to find the time to reach up wider audiences through her regular economics blog in the New York Times. I first met Nancy in person in 1994 when she came to the Gender Institute here as a visiting fellow. This was the very early days of the Gender Institute and Nancy's enthusiastic and intellectually rigorous engagement with students and staff gave us a huge and inspiring push forward. One of Nancy's publications which most sticks in my mind from earlier times is a paper she wrote on global patterns of female household headship in 1991. Another was one of her probably best known works, the book Who Pays for the Kids? which has been and continues to be a must-read for anyone concerned with the gender dynamics of families. In the mid-1990s, when I was undertaking comparative research on female-headed households, Nancy's writings were absolutely central to its conceptual grounding. On top of this, when I completed the first draft of my book, Women-Headed Households, Nancy was kind enough, despite many demands upon her from elsewhere, to give it a read-through. Quite an honour. When the comments came back, about 10 pages of them in toto, I was completely knocked out with the time and care, both unpaid, I should add, that Nancy had clearly put into the job. The incisive nature of her suggestions benefited me greatly and allowed me to pull the project through to completion. So, a very huge debt to Nancy, not only for this, but also for writing numerous references for me along the way and for her eminently supportive endorsements for books, including the International Handbook. Thank you, Nancy who will be speaking tonight on the subject of gender and the care economy, one of the most formidable, outstanding challenges to gender justice and rights, and perhaps particularly for women in poverty. And last but not least, I also owe major personal and professional debts to Professor Maxine Molyneux, Director of the Institute for the Study of the Americas, University of London. I met Maxine in person even earlier than my other guests, back in the late 1980s. The first encounter came when Maxine was appointed by Elgar Publishers as reader on my first book, co-authored with Dr. Lynn Bryden, who's also in the audience tonight. From the vantage point of 2011, 
The book was somewhat embarrassingly titled Women in the Third World, which I'm afraid just goes to show how long I've been in the field. Um, in September 1988, um, when I had just moved back from Liverpool University, my first lecturing job, to the LSE, Maxine was good enough to come to my basement flat in N4, shared with my sister Adrian down there, to discuss the volume face to face. I was rather terrified at the prospect, since I, I was a little known junior academic at the time, and Maxine an already established international figure. Although Maxine's young son Alex was in tow, Maxine having to multitask as usual, and as I remember, Alex was immensely inquisitive about our rather cluttered surroundings. Those of you who've been in my office or in my home know what we're talking about as a health and safety risk. Um, Maxine managed to give me truly clear and constructive advice as to desirable revisions. Needless to say, Maxine's pioneering theoretical work on practical and strategic gender interest was already in the book, which was subsequently published in 1989. And while, as the years have gone on, I have tended to drop women in the third world from my reading lists, Maxine's early papers have stayed, and on account of standing the test of time, continue to be widely cited in the GAD literature. That more than 20 years on, Maxine's groundbreaking formulation remains a core concept in both gender analysis and policy is a truly amazing feat. Like the other speakers, however, Maxine's work has by no means stayed still. Over the years, her publications and public appearances have provided considerable and critical food for thought with regard to gender and politics, the much used and abused term social capital, gender justice and rights, and most recently, the gender dimensions and implications of conditional cash transfer programs, which is a theme she'll be talking to tonight. Like her fellow panelists, Maxine has published prolifically, has advised countless international agencies, and has given keynote addresses all over the world. Despite all this, she too has been a wonderful colleague. She has never let me down, whether this is in finding time to comment on books and papers or to do that very burdensome task of writing references. Indeed, it is to my great personal gratitude that Maxine has sacrificed a high-level conference in India this weekend to take part in our panel. I know that we're all here tonight to get down to the serious scholarly business of discussing some key contours of gendered poverty in the second decade of the 21st century. However, I would also like to emphasize how this occasion represents an opportunity for me to offer profound thanks to three women who have never failed to deliver on any front. To have Diane, Nancy, and Maxine in one place and alongside me on this stage tonight is a true personal life highlight. I very much hope that this will also be a highlight for everyone in the audience and an appropriate marker to celebrate the 100th anniversary of International Women's Day. Thank you very much. talking uh, um, first off about gender and uh, gender poverty budgets crises. So thank you Sylvia for inviting me and your generous introduction and it's wonderful to be here to see uh, so many old friends and I hope make some new ones before the, the evening's out. Uh, so these are my four um, key words. I'm going to start off with one slide that refers to the contribution that I've uh, made to the handbook and then move on from that uh, to talk about the links between gender, uh, gender poverty budgets and crises. So the contribution that I've made uh, to the uh, International Handbook, Chapter 80, uh, <laughs> uh, co-authored with um, Rhonda Sharp from the University of South Australia, uh, was looking at the issue of gender responsive budgeting and, and women's poverty. And for those you, you, for whom this concept is unfamiliar, I'll just say that gender responsive budgeting consists of the use of tools and the adoption of procedures to ensure that government bu budgets support the achievement of gender in, uh, equality and indeed particularly address uh, the issues of uh, poor women. 
It's employed in a variety of ways by a number of governments uh, around the world, uh, and it can support, as we argued in our contribution, the reduction of women's poverty by focusing on how budgets impact on poor women in particular, and by supporting women's financial autonomy. I know this is something that uh, Sylvia has always uh, emphasized uh, a lot. Uh, when we're thinking about gender and poverty, uh, we can't just look at this at a household level. We have to look at um, the issues of the, uh, the resources and the control of resources of individuals within households, and the issue of women's financial autonomy is very important. Well, I'm going to leave you to uh, read the chapter. I hope you're all going to be out there um, <laughs> taking account of this, this discount. So I'll just say that the conclusion we came to after re reviewing um, um, a number uh, of, case, of evidence and of countries that Rhonda and I have both uh, been involved uh, in with, with women's organizations or with uh, government institutions, um, we thought it had contributed in a number of countries to addressing women's poverty. Uh, in some countries, it's enabled poor women to have more voice in budget decision-making, especially at the local level. Uh, it's also, in some other countries, improved the allocations of expenditure to services, infrastructure, income transfers, and employment that benefit poor women. And it's also led, in some countries, to changing of taxes and user fees in ways that benefit poor women. But I'm not going to give you the detail because you need to read the book. What I want to do is move on from that to talk about economic crisis, but to link that with government budgets and um, with gender equality and women's poverty. So first I want to uh, identify phase one of the economic crisis, the fiscal stimulus phase. Um, following the, the, uh, the onset of the financial crisis in, in Wall Street and the City of London and the way it rippled out around the world, um, in fact, then we did see a widespread expansion of real public expenditure if you compare 2008-9 with 2007. And it wasn't just rich countries who were doing this. There's a recent report out by UNICEF um, that reviews all the evidence and uh, says that 85% of developing countries also able to expand public expenditure as a response to the crisis to try and mitigate the recessionary uh, impacts of the financial crisis. And even the IMF became a little bit more, um, uh, loosened the conditions that it attaches uh, to its loans for quite a few countries and uh, permitted um, a widespread expansion of real public expenditure. However, when you look at the detail of what did countries do, what did they spend it on, in country after country, both uh, high-income countries and middle-income countries, you see a big focus on roads and cars. I knew it was roads and cars played a big role in the UK, uh, but when I was reading about Argentina, roads and cars played a big role there. I was talking to feminist economists from India. Roads and cars played a big role there. So there were public projects, investment in, in, in road repair, uh, construction of new roads, re repair bridges, construction of new bridges. There were tax breaks uh, for buying new cars. Uh, in India, um, uh, the government uh, instructed that uh, all civil servants who were, were entitled to have a car should buy a new car and this would support the car industry. And so many people, uh, many feminists looking at this felt that preserving male jobs was given priority in terms of how the fiscal stimulus was constructed. And even in countries like India, where there has uh, been a certain amount of institutionalization of certain elements of gender responsive budgeting, they, they didn't use uh, these analytical tools to look at the composition of the fiscal stimulus. So feminist economists in the USA, friend of ours, uh, Randy Albelder, I think, uh, uh, coined this phrase, a macho stimulus plan. It didn't, for instance, uh, address the issue of increasing expenditure and investment in care services. <coughs> And uh, in, in India, um, feminist icon economists that I know there were arguing uh, that, well, it was, it was good to have a fiscal stimulus, but what about some support for the small and medium-sized enterprises that were employing lots of women, as well as the infrastructure and the car industry? 
So fiscal stimulus in many countries, but I think the, f uh, the feeling among um, many um, feminist analysts is that this was giving more priority to um, addressing male jobs. And particularly, you, you got this even in countries where the first uh, recessionary impact of the crisis was on female jobs. Uh, Cambodia, lots of women lost their jobs in the garment industry, but the fiscal stimulus in Cambodia was concentrated on the construction industry. But now we're into phase two of the crisis. Um, and for many of us, that means fiscal austerity. Um, the crisis had different impacts in different parts of the world, and uh, the trajectories in phase two have been different. Many economies in Asia and Latin America recovered quite quickly in terms at least of, of uh, uh, GNP, especially the middle income countries, but European economies did not, and governments have introduced fiscal austerity programs. And UNICEF reports that many low-income and middle-income countries are also planning fiscal contraction, and now the IMF is uh, uh, saying it's time for fiscal consolidation. We may let you expand your public expenditure last year, but not this year, not next year. A few governments are, do seem to be using uh, gender-responsive budgeting to help manage deficit reduction. I was in Iceland. Um, about three or four weeks ago, and there they have a new government trying to clear up the mess after the banking crisis in Iceland, and that government is committed to introducing gender-responsive budgeting and trying to analyze if it's making cuts, um, if it's uh, changing um, uh, fiscal policy, uh, where are the costs and benefits going to fall, and can it institutionalize uh, as it does this? Um, uh, looking at um, what's it going to do to gender equality and in particular what implications is it going to have for poor women. Uh, and in Spain, in Andalusia, the regional government controls a large amount of public expenditure. They have a system for using gender responsive budgeting to try and prioritize different sorts of expenditure for what's number the really high priorities in terms of supporting gender equality and addressing situation of poor women. And then they've tried to use that prioritization system to relatively protect those areas of expenditure as they try to uh, manage the um, reduction in, in public uh, expenditure to reduce their budget deficit. I want to talk more now about gender poverty and fiscal austerity in the UK since we're here in London. And I'm going to draw on uh, some analysis done by the UK Women's Budget Group. I can see uh, 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 Sue Himmelwhite and Eve Pearson here that I've been doing uh, a lot of work with, and there are some other members of the UK Women's Budget Group in the area. So this is collective work we've been doing. We're a, a network of about 200 academics, members of NGOs, trade unions, mainly women, but some men too. And uh, we've been trying to analyze the gender dimensions of government budgets and expenditure reviews since 1989 and share the results with politicians, journalists, women's organizations, poverty organizations. It's unpaid voluntary work, except for a part-time uh, coordinator. And um, we try to develop both critique and have dialogue with government. Uh, the dialogue part is not happening at the moment. Um, and the conservative uh, liberal coalition government is not using uh, a, 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 a kind of a, a gender responsive a budgeting approach in any meaningful way. If you want to know more about this group, that's the website. So what we've been doing is uh, some gender analysis of cutbacks in expenditure on public services. And I'm going to uh, present to you uh, some of the work that we've done that uh, Sue Himmelwhite here particularly have been leading on together uh, with Howard Reed, uh, who is, uh, who's uh, got a lovely model that models the distributional effects of spending cuts by household type. Uh, and you can do this according to their gender characteristics. This was the synergy. He, he had the model. He was looking at different um, uh, household uh, groups according to which uh, income a decile they were in. And we came along and said, we think you could bring some gender analysis into this by looking at households in terms of their gendered characteristics. And if you want to know more about the methodology, uh, you can find it, in fact, on the 
the website of the Trade Union Congress because uh, that's where he first, um, uh, that the, it was for the TUC that he first did the analysis. So I'm just going to give you two, uh, three or four charts now with just the key um, uh, results from this, uh, looking at the effects of the cutbacks in expenditure on public services. This doesn't deal with the taxes and the benefits. Uh, it looks at um, this list of services, flat rate, uh, the kind of services where it doesn't make sense to try and allocate according to different households. Flood defences, for instance, or um, um, expenditure on uh, the armed forces. Um, but many other services are used differentially by different households, and you can get the information on how the households are differentially using the services from the household survey. Well, um, if you do this in the uh, just looking at households um, by decile, by income decile, and you look at what's the, the effect of these spending cuts by income group as a percentage of their net income, you see. Uh, the lowest decile, decile one, that's the poorest decile, uh, that's the one with the biggest percentage uh, adverse impact on their um, standard of living through these cuts in these uh, uh, public services. And decile 10, the richest, is the one with the least proportionate impact. So it's a very, very regressive uh, distribution of the impact. We said, let's go a bit beyond that. Let's introduce some gender analysis even though we have the challenge uh, that Sylvia has often pointed to, that the household survey does not give us data disaggregated by sex. It does not tell us who in the household is using these different services, only tells us that the household is using those services. Longer run plan is to get it to agitate for it to be disaggregated by sex. But we can still do something, even though it's not. So we said, first, let's, we can look at different family types. Single, no children, lone parents, couple without children, couple with children, single pensioner, couple pensioner. Lone parents, we know 95% of lone parents are women. Uh, guess which group is taking the biggest proportionate hit on their living standards as a result of the cutbacks in the public services. So you can see uh, the bar chart is much longer for the lone parents than anybody else. And lone parents, we know, are also disproportionately poor women. Uh, uh, after that, uh, we get single pensioners. Um, and then Sue said, oh, well, I'm sure we can disaggregate among single pensioners between male and female. Let's do that. Uh, so when you do that, you find it's the female single pensioners who are disproportionately affected. The couple pensioners at least affected, and of course one reason for this disproportionate impact on female single pensioners is care services. Female single pensioners live longer and they're not living in a household with somebody else taking care of them, so they make more use of publicly provided care services and those care services are going to take a hit. Uh, also, we can look and see what difference does it make with households have male wages. Uh, we look there at households with male earners only, female earners only, earners of both sexes, and no earners. Well, as you might imagine, it's the households with no earners that take the biggest hit because they are they, they, they're more dependent on the public services and also uh, the, the loss of the public services is a bigger, a bigger proportion of their living standards. Uh, but after that, it's the households with female earners only. So not having a male wage in the household uh, is, uh, is very important, both in terms of the use of public services and what that does to your living standard. The, not surprisingly, the, uh, the households with earners of both sexes were the uh, least worst affected, and after that, the male earners. But not having a male wage in the household makes a difference because of the persistence of the gender wage gap. So we came to the conclusion that as currently designed, the kind of expenditure cuts we've got in the UK are terrible from a gender and poverty perspective. As currently designed, they're likely to have the worst impact on poor people, among whom women are disproportionately represented. They're likely to undermine women's financial autonomy, and the new welfare reform bill that had just been introduced in Parliament's pushing even further in that direction. They're likely to add to women's care responsibilities as public services are cut. We think there actually are alternatives. I've not got time to go into those, but um, 
You could cut differently, you could cut less and later, and you could tax the financial sector and high-income uh, people more. Uh, so we'll be wanting as well to put these alternatives on the agenda and say it's not inevitable that the aftermath of an economic crisis uh, should be that um, gender equality is jeopardized and that poor women in particular are, are hit very hard. It could have been done differently, and if it had been done differently, uh, some of these worst of these adverse impacts could have been avoided. Thank you very much. Nancy Fulbury will now be talking about gender and the care of the economy, poverty and inequality. Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's it's been. Um, uh, uh, a really wonderful experience to work on these issues uh, with such a group of talented and fabulous scholars and to be part of a kind of continuing wave or surge of, of terrific research um, on these topics. Um, uh, the collection that Sylvia has put together is brilliant and beautiful. It's varied. It's, it's, it's uh, theoretical. It's empirical. It's practical. It's uh, just a wonderful uh, tour de force, and so it's a very great honor to be here to help celebrate its publication, and also to have a chance to learn from Diane and Maxine and Sylvia and all of you a little bit more about what's going on here in, in the UK and how this connects to the uh, kind of l larger global uh, economic crisis that, that we're dealing with. I. Um, I, I always I have a, a, a picture here. It's a, a uh, it's it's kind of an icon for me. It's it's an image from uh, a Red Women's uh, Collective from the uh, 70s, somewhere here in London. I've never actually been able to find out who did it. it I used it as a cover on uh, Who Pays for the Kids, uh, which Sylvia mentioned. But I I use it in every every PowerPoint I ever give because it just. Uh, uh, sets the stage for uh, what I see as a, as a really central and continuing theme, which is the process of, um, by which workers are restored and recreated and created as a part of the whole um, global economic system, as a part of the circular, circular flow. So what I'm going to do tonight is, in, in a sense, you know, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that I w actually visited here in, I think it was ni 1996 or, or 1997, um, and I spoke in this very room, I think, feels familiar, and um, <laughs> some things have changed and some things haven't changed about my thinking, and I wanted to take an opportunity to try to update uh, what I feel like I've, um, what I think I've learned that is new in that time period, but also to relate it to the global um, financial um, crisis and the kind of political challenge that we're all facing uh, today. So um, I, I have always tried to situate my analysis within a kind of um, specifically feminist critique of political economy, um, looking at the social organization of care and emphasizing that collective conflict over the distribution of the cost of caring for dependents can cross cut and connect with, intersect and overlap with conflict over the distribution of of um, surplus. So in many ways this comes down to thinking about how care work is valued and how it's not valued by a modern uh, capitalist economy. And I think this is a theme that has really bec been now richly explored in a very interdisciplinary way by um, this surge of feminist scholarship. There are many reasons why caregivers are economically vulnerable, but I want to kind of uh, review them for you tonight. Uh, first of all, care for human dependence is costly. It takes time, it takes money. Um, not just children, the elderly, the sick, the disabled. Uh, secondly, asymmetric investment by uh, caregivers puts them at a disadvantage. As economists, we literally describe this as a form of sunk costs. Uh, once you've um, uh, 
uh, taken responsibility for someone, it's very hard to then revoke or, or renege upon that responsibility. And as a result, caregivers are often held hostage by their emotional attachment. This connects up to the theme that Sylvia and other contributors to the book called the feminization of obligation or the feminization of responsibility that I think really emphasizes the, the ways in which norms and preferences of caregiving uh, play a tremendous role in the gen gender division of labor and the accumulation of gender-based disadvantage. Uh, I think the language of economics is also useful and important here. Children literally are non-excludable in consumption. They're like the future. They are public goods. Uh, nobody owns them. We all, to some extent, benefit from effective um, nurturance of them. And contractual arrangements for control of children or even partial payback through, for instance, pension systems are very difficult to enforce because they represent an intertemporal allocation of goods and services. And as we're now seeing, it's very easy for the polity to renege on its commitments to repay its citizens for the work that they have previously performed. So, um, uh, it, you know, there are diff many different ways, many different vocabularies that have been used to describe the, this kind of theoretical framework. And um, I guess I favor uh, a, a vocabulary that allows us to look at hybrid systems, at um, the ways in which different um, w uh, forms of social organization engage in kind of violent, uh, but also sometimes sexually kind of charged um, uh, uh, interaction and combat. Um, I guess I think of the early stages of development in in Europe as being kind of a capitalist patriarchy, but I think now we've moved towards a situation where patriarchal is more of an adjective and capitalism is more of a noun. I guess I see patriarch patriarchy as a little bit more of the like living creature there, the Godzilla, and capitalism is more that armored uh, uh, monster. Um, that I think is actually in the process of subduing, um, but remaining also pretty dependent upon that um, biological form. So I think there's a long history and an important history of women gradually gaining uh, permission to participate in capitalism in the face of a lot of ideological and political resistance. And I've just completed a book I wanted to uh, briefly mention called Greed, Lust, and Gender which is a history of economic ideas that have changed as women have kind of gained access to uh, participation in capitalism. And I love the cover image, I think you'll probably recognize as a William Blake um, image of Eve and the serpent. And um, I'm not quite sure what's happened to Adam. He's either, he's either been knocked flat or he's, maybe he's just <laughs> taking a bit of a nap um, while Eve um, moves to the... Uh, to the center stage. I'm not sure quite what, no one is ever quite sure what William Blake was thinking of. So it makes him so great. Um, but, you know, basically in this process, in my view, women gain self-ownership and that both wage employment and fertility decline have some empowering effects. Women engage in collective political action and wage employment increases their individual bargaining power. But uh, the problem within this patriarchal capitalist system is that Self-ownership is really not sufficient. I mean, women do gain increasingly with the development of capitalism self-ownership, but they continue to, to specialize in producing things that can't be owned and sold. That is to care for children and other dependents. And that, uh, I think, is a fundamental cause of women's um, um, increased vulnerability within capitalism as caregivers. So I think um, as many of the essays in... Um, the volume that we're celebrating tonight point out, the feminization of poverty doesn't seem quite apt, but the pauperization of motherhood or the motherization of poverty or the increased role of care for dependence as a cause of women's economic vulnerability remains very much in play. This is a famous uh, British Airways advertisement. Um, uh, 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 it's quite old, it's from the 80s, but I, it's kind of an iconic ad because I think it, it, it does a very wonderful job of conveying how often uh, images of care are, not, are both sexualized and kind of maternalized. And it's a kind of odd hybrid um, between those two. But um, more profoundly, it just illustrates uh, 
a, a, a basic point that I think a huge accumulation of empirical research has now substantiated, that motherhood is economically risky, mothers are paid significantly less than other women, all else equal. In the paid economy, jobs that require nurturance are paid significantly less than other jobs, and occupational segregation in caring jobs like this one uh, explains a large part of the difference in men's and women's pay. But I think there are also some economic trends that help explain why, in, uh, why political conflict over these issues is intensifying. One of these is that women's very entrance into self-ownership, wage labor, and participation in the capitalist economy has increased their individual bargaining power and the opportunity cost of their time. It's reduced the supply of women to caring occupations like teaching and, and nursing. And it's also led to greater demand for services like child care, elder care, and home health care that are financed through the state rather than provided at home by women. And those, that increase in the price of providing care is leading to intensified distributional conflict on a global level to a great deal of cultural backlash. It's very connected to outsourcing and immigration and to institutional efforts to control costs and improve, and improve efficiency and to uh, increased resort to automation and the use of information and technology. And here's where the story begins to provide some background to the specific budget cuts that, that, um, that Diane was outlining in her talk. Capitalism itself is often, depended, is often depicted as handsome, uh, energetic, strong, um, and kind of liberated, whereas the welfare state is often depicted <laughs> as uh, I think this is, yeah, this is from a British punk, famous British punk rock uh, uh, cover. Uh, the welfare state is, is kind of uh, uh, feminized. And um, in particular now, it's, it, the, uh, it, it's, it's associated with, the nanny state is associated with this notion that, that, that welfare spending has gotten out of control and the public sector is too large. So here you have this great um, dinosaur, you know, the outdated welfare state, the debt, leaning over, drooling over um, the little baby in the, um, uh, the nanny state. And in fact, there's an incredible variety of visual images of the nanny state online. I urge you, uh, in your, in your spare, spare time, if you're looking for, for, for visual amusement, to, to, to uh, search on those images. And the fact is that the welfare state does fulfill a somewhat feminine role that a lot of entitlement and discretionary social spending is devoted to the care of dependents, and a lot of it is provided by women who are getting at least some partial support from the state. And there is a tremendous amount of distributional conflict based on nation, on citizenship, on race, ethnicity, on gender, on age, and also uh, very profoundly on class, a lot of conflict over who should pay the cost of care. And I think there's a lot of evidence that globalization is in intensifying class conflict because national boundaries are becoming less relevant. Why should you bother to grow and educate your own workers when you can free ride on the efforts of other families or other nations? Um, global capital is less dependent on the welfare functions of the nation state than it once was. And I think that's um, uh, one of the driving forces of the uh, so you're saying. Okay, so uh, this, this is also a cartoon I show in almost every PowerPoint I give, but, it, but it's just so great. And of course, you know, we don't, in the U.S., we do not actually send our children to Mexico, but we do import our nannies from Mexico, which is kind of uh, the same thing. The point is, is that this sort of logic of cost minimization uh, uh, really is resulting not only in a tremendous growth in outsourcing um, and um, vulnerability to unemployment, but also in um, uh, some very fundamental redistribution of the, of the costs of, of care work along racial and ethnic lines. So uh, I guess I want to leave you with the idea that family policy itself it, uh, represents a kind of a, a, a focal point of a neoliberal dilemma, which is that capitalist institutions need families, but they would prefer not to pay for them and uh, international competition is intensifying these pressures to offload them. I think there are very important parallels here with global warming and with struggles over environmental issues. The, sa the similarity lies in the fact that we're, we're facing an international coordination problem. We need to coordinate or, or the regulation of a public good. That public good is the future, future generations, future citizens, um, future workers. 
Uh, we're seeing uh, a, a level of unsustainable utilization of unpriced assets. So just as we're using up forests and, and fish, fisheries because they're unpriced, we're also using up families and communities by exploiting a lot of unpriced labor there without providing support from it. Not surprisingly, that labor is increasingly being withdrawn and reallocated. We see a lot of negative spillovers. That's a term we use for um, uh, for pollution, but it, it, it also is a very applies very neatly to crime, to poor health, and to the inadequate development of human capabilities. And I think this uh, deficit debt problem that uh, many nations around the world are facing is a bona fide problem. It, it reflects a kind of distributional conflict, trying to uh, use up assets that we've inherited from the past, which you might see, you know, patri patriarchy actually is is kind of a past legacy that capital systems are desperately trying to deploy to, to make it into the future, but also offloading costs uh, in terms of, um, of climate change and community change and loss of social capital uh, into the future in an effort to avert or minimize um, current conflicts, uh, but in my view, really often serving to exacerbate and intensify those conflicts. So I guess I would like to leave you tonight with um, uh, an emphasis on the need to really continue the surge, to build the wave, and to uh, move this research agenda forward. Uh, while um, uh, Sylvia's volume does a really great job of showing, revealing the gender dimensions of poverty and inequality, it also shows in many instances that our measures of poverty and inequality are very incomplete. They don't include consideration of distribution within the family or distribution over time or the tremendous importance of non-market work or um, the assignment of responsibility for the care of dependents. And we really need as social scientists to uh, mobilize much more effectively around the development of better measures of poverty and inequality in order to um, uh, address these problems. Um, in particular, I believe we need to focus on this issue of intrafamily resource flows, both in the cross section and uh, over time, not just in the family, but through the welfare state. So, in addition to gender budgeting of the sort that, that Diane was emphasizing and outlining in her talk, we also really need to look at age budgeting and at other dimensions of budgeting that involve the care for dependents and make sure that we can develop intergenerational transfer systems that are equitable and um, sustainable. And uh, in the process, maybe we need to develop a little bit of a different theoretical currency. Um, thank you. going to um, give her talk from the podium here. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Sylvia, for... Is this working? Can you hear me? Again, thank you very, very much, Sylvia, for inviting me, and it is truly wonderful to see such a great audience turning out for this event on gender and poverty and to celebrate the book. Uh, I'm going to be talking about um, social protection, in particular um, cash transfers. In a sense, what I'm going to say follows very well from uh, the two previous contributions, wonderful contributions from Diane and Nancy, because I'm going to be talking about the motherization of poverty and, and indeed something that has been happening as a result of the increased efforts to extend um, social protection, which is a very good and welcome thing, but the manner in which it's being extended raises some important questions for uh, uh, gender analysts. Now, this is uh, an event to celebrate the appearance of the handbook. And I do want to start by saying that Sylvia and her contributors are to be congratulated many times over because it's not only an impressive achievement in terms of the range of issues, the theories, the data that's presented, but its richness is testimony to more than 30 years of feminist theory and research in the field of women and development and beyond that field. Thanks in no small measure to that work, analysis of the causes and consequences of poverty 
have become much more refined. We know that gender matters in tackling poverty. We know that gender relations need to be transformed if women and girls are to benefit from development initiatives. We know that men and women experience poverty differently, in different ways, and they have different forms of vulnerability. And those different forms of vulnerability require different approaches. There's no one size fits all. And we know that tackling female poverty and vulnerability has clear multiplier effects on children's health and education and family well-being uh, uh, overall. Of course, it's also a very good thing in itself because it, uh, it's part of the agenda for social justice and equality, but it also contributes to development efforts. So there's a long history of struggle to get those kinds of um, ideas across, and I think they have now become widely accepted in the development policy community. But unfortunately, these lessons are very unevenly absorbed into policy. Uh, or if they're incorporated into policy design, they all too often disappear at implementation stage. I often think that gender analysis is like the Cheshire Cat of development policy. Now you see it, now you don't. So it's almost as if there is a recurring process in the field of gender and development of learning and forgetting. And I think that's especially evident in many of the efforts being made to tackle extreme poverty. These efforts are accelerating in the face of the global financial crisis and in the face of the expected uh, food crisis, which is looming and is already having an effect. Uh, many countries have signed up uh, to an agenda to increase and extend social protection in developing countries, and quite a lot of money has been put behind that. And as Diane alluded to this, social expenditure has risen in developing countries over recent years in order to address this problem, but also, of course, to try to meet the development, uh, Millennium Development Goals in 2015. Now, it follows from what I said before that um, gender-sensitive anti-poverty or social protection programs are going to be much more effective than those that are gender-blind. And yet, what we find is a uh, very distressing kind of and repeated sort of pattern of uh, gender blindness in social protection. And a recent study by the Overseas Development Institute of 16 social protection programs from different parts of the world showed a surprising lack of gender sensitivity in all but two cases, and even those two had only sort of semi-responded to the need to incorporate uh, uh, gender sensitive design. And research on cash transfer programs in Mexico, uh, which has been done by a number of us here, including uh, very brilliantly uh, Mercedes Gonzalez de la Rocha, who is somewhere here, I think, up there, uh, has, <laughs> has illuminated the uh, gender dynamics of these programs and some of the positive as well as the negative effects. We've done some recent research in the Andes of Latin America, Marilyn Thompson and I and some others, and Marilyn is here too somewhere, um, to try to see, see what is happening on the ground and how women respond to these cash transfer programs. And unfortunately, uh, it confirms again the overall picture that there are reasons to worry that the gender lessons have really not been taken on board sufficiently, even, uh, or sometimes even at all, in poverty alleviation work in that region. Now, we have to keep this in mind when we see the reports of progress in tackling poverty that are emerging uh, from different parts of the world. In Latin America, a report just published by the UN Latin American Economic Commission, CEPAL, shows that poverty has fallen in 12 Latin American countries. And this is partly a, a result of the commodity export boom in some countries. But it's also because Latin America has spent more on social protection in recent years and has made a particular effort to tackle extreme poverty. The report instances, in particular, conditional cash transfers as the main reason that poverty has fallen and recommends that these programs be further extended to meet MDG goals. I would just note that 32% of the Latin American population remains in poverty, according to this report, so it is only a job half done. But indeed, this recommendation to extend cash transfers uh, is, in, in many sense, 
in alignment with a broader international consensus in the development policy community that CCTs are a kind of magic bullet for dealing with poverty uh, quickly, efficiently, and uh, very importantly, of course, at low cost. But one wonders whether and if so how far these efforts have, uh, have actually brought change to the lives of the poorest women and indeed to the poorest of the poor. And that was what we were uh, uh, doing our research on, in fact, uh, looking at um, those very, very poor and marginalized communities in the Andes, uh, Andean region of Latin America, specifically in Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, and Peru. Now, I don't have much time to really talk about the findings except to give you a general picture, but um, I want to, to place it in context context by acknowledging that um, all Latin American governments have made uh, quite sort of um, you know energetic declarations in terms of their commitments to the MDG goals uh, of gender equality and women's empowerment and that most of them also have made um, claims to have mainstreamed uh, these commitments into policy uh, in a, a wide variety of areas now um, this has got a longer history, of course, because often under pressure from active women's movements, Latin American governments some time ago domesticated international frameworks such as CEDAW and the Beijing Platform of Action and have since adopted uh, all kinds of measures aimed to secure female empowerment in almost all areas of social life. Quotas exist in most countries to enhance parliamentary representation or at least party representation of women. Equality legislation exists to reform um, previously uh, established and quite archaic patriarchal family codes. Programs and laws um, have been developed to uh, tackle gender-based violence. And, and those kinds of things, among many measures, actually taken to tackle gender inequality. So progress has been made on these uh, questions, although again, partially. But um, also, we've seen quite a lot of progress in other areas of rights, for example, indigenous rights, and the Andean region in particular is notable for the considerable activism, as you probably know, on these issues, both by indigenous communities and by some governments uh, in recent years, notably, of course, uh, Bolivia and Ecuador. Um, now, the growing international support uh, for social protection is a, a very welcome uh, development, and uh, because um, so many countries in Latin America have seen a kind of rise in uh, expenditure, we, we can be optimistic that some of this will have a positive effect, and indeed it will do on women's um, situation. But of course, conditional cash transfers are only a very partial kind of response to poverty alleviation, and there is a worry there just about how much they can address the much more serious problems and you know, long-term problems of the very considerable numbers of uh, Latin Americans who remain in poverty or on the edge of poverty. Now, conditional cash transfers are, as most of you probably know, they're non-contributory government programs that combine income support for the poorest households, generally those who have no form of insurance, and that's a very substantial number, uh, percentage of the population in Latin America. Non-contributory uh, you know, assistance is, are combined, and this is the innovative part of it, with human development goals. So they're designed to build human capital, uh, to avoid intergenerational transmission of poverty through measures to improve children's education, nutrition, and maternal and infant health. So receipt of the cash transfers is made conditional on a number of um, things being performed by the mothers, that's to say the children have to uh, attend school regularly, they have to have checkups at health clinics, uh, and, and, and there has to be uh, attendance at all kinds of chats about child nutrition and so on and so forth. Now this child-centered model was pioneered in Latin America in the mid-1990s by the Cardozo administration in Brazil, and it was quickly followed in Mexico uh, by the um, program that became known as Oportunidades. And of course, that same model is being rolled out pretty much across the Latin American region, as well as in parts of Africa and even in the Middle East, although with less conditionalities or no conditionalities. The conditionality model is very much the Latin American model. Cash transfers now cover about 20% of the Latin American population. And the largest programs, the ones in Brazil and Mexico, cover 11 million and 5 million households, respectively. So these are pretty substantial programs. 
in those parts of Latin America. Now, the current policy emphasis on CCTs is, is widely debated. I mean, few could fail to welcome the good results achieved, but there are concerns over the design, over the sustainability, and the potential political instrumentality of the new programs. In Latin America, critics see these programs as assistentialist, that's to say just giving handouts to the poor, although a few programs like uh, Chile Solidario and some pilot projects in Mexico have begun to incorporate elements that help to provide beneficiaries with exit strategies, and some uh, also have some gender-sensitive components incorporated. Mm -hmm. Chile's Puente program is perhaps the most intensive and far-reaching of these schemes, but uh, it is seen as rather expensive by other countries, and it re relies on uh, quite close contact with social workers and a large range of services um, available to, to poor households in the scheme, which are not always uh, readily replicated in poorer countries. So it remains um, an open question um, whether the most favoured form of social assistance, i.e. CCT, stay you know, locked into um, some of these, uh, their more negative tendencies like clientelism or short-termism or simply being ineffective or evolve into non-discretionary, you know, more rights-based uh, poverty eradication programs. Um, what is um, encouraging about current policy debate in Latin America as elsewhere, is that um, there is now concern to try to move beyond project-level initiatives to develop government-coordinated social protection programs, which over time will provide a much more integrated and effective uh, policy response to poverty, exclusion, and vulnerability, for example, by including you know, um, the informal sector in insurance programs. For now, though, CCTs um, are best seen as a first step in relieving poverty, but that's perfectly fine, providing it is followed by other steps, um, such as improving access to other forms of social protection and also ensuring better delivery of existing services in health and education, which so far remain pretty um, weakly developed in many countries. Now, while there's a lively debate over the adequacy or otherwise of cash transfer pro projects and programs, it's so far taken really very little account of the debate over gender and household impacts. And as far as I know, um, no gender impact assessments have been carried out prior to these programs being rolled out in Latin America or indeed anywhere else. And only a handful of evaluations examine gender and household impacts with any degree of precision. Now we do know that CCTs are successful in meeting their core objectives, which concern children. Uh, these programs are targeted both within the, um, uh, targeted at the poorest, and uh, they're also targeted um, within the household, so that uh, they, they are targeted at children's uh, well-being. So they um, really are only, most evaluations really only monitor the effects on children. But um, this is a form of, of what I would call micro-targeting, and then I don't myself think, and I'm sure others might agree, that this is not the best approach to tackling poverty because of the interdependency of household members. However, um, they, we have to, to say that these programs are uh, positive in uh, raising children's attendance at school, raising their nutritional levels, and indeed households do appear to be more capable of managing risks thanks to the uh, subsidy they receive, which is usually half uh, or less than half than the minimum wage. Now, regarding gender, um, the positive feature of these programs is the giving of the transfer directly to the mothers. And this is something that women beneficiaries um, across the, uh, country, the, the, the continent, really, and, and I think all the research seems to indicate is very much appreciated by the women. There are sometimes risks that uh, they are subject to violence by their husbands because they uh, want it taken away from them. But on the whole, it's a positive development which women greatly appreciate. And over and over again, um, the surveys show and our research showed that women felt that their status and their self-esteem had improved um, considerably as a result of having more control over household uh, resources and being able to make more decisions, and they felt that was uh, something that they could, um, they could, as it were, develop more um, uh, ability to influence their choices elsewhere as a result of having that. So there were some, um, you know, quite uh, 
positive indications that these things um, were helpful. But it has to be said that um, despite those kind of effects of these programs, there's very little else that actually does tackle uh, women's um, situation or indeed uh, add to their capabilities. I mean, we found that none of the programs that we researched had any equality or empowerment elements um, expressly designed for the women beneficiaries. And further, that most of the um, needs that these women expressed went completely unrecognized and unaddressed. So there, yet, you know, although we've had you know, improvements in these countries uh, on human development indicators more generally, uh, women's longevity and educational levels have gone up. Um, these regions still show significant gaps in income, education, and health. And indeed, the latest human development report in the Latin American Caribbean region, 2010 one, which tracks gaps on reproductive health empowerment and workforce participation, shows that gender discrimination is well above the world average, mainly due to the high rates of childbirth among adolescents, low participation of women in the wage economy, uh, these conditions are even more marked um, amongst uh, poor and marginalized indigenous and Afro-descendant communities uh, that were the focus of the social protection schemes that we analyzed, i.e. the poorest of the poor. And I mean, just one um, datum for you, I mean, ethnic differences in maternal mortality and um, are particularly pronounced, and you find this across the board where you have these deep pockets of poverty for instance, in uh, Ecuador, the national maternal mortality rate was 74 per 100,000 live births, whereas it was 250 among remote indigenous communities. And it can be double or triple national uh, averages in many other similar contexts. So there is a kind of real problem here about if you want to reach you know, vulnerable groups and you want to make sure that you're reaching them effectively, you do have to look at the needs of vulnerable women. Now, why is there this disconnect between all these declarations, which you find um, both in programs and in policies uh, and in government statements, between what is said and what happens? Why is there this, um, this problem that it doesn't seem to percolate through to the on-the-ground delivery and the implementation of programs? Well, there are many reasons for it, obviously. I mean, political will, uh, there's arguments about resources, there's all kinds of don't overload the program, I'm constantly told when I ask this question. But um, it's also to do, it seems, uh, when you look at the evidence, with the degree of influence exerted by women's movements over design of the program and over the um, implementation phases. So that if women's movements or organizations that are committed to the principles of empowerment and equality are involved in assisting in the delivery of some of these services, you tend to get better results. Uh, and of course, what we found was that there was very little involvement at any stage in these programs of um, women's movements uh, and very little input and very little activity around um, those needs. So there is a kind of issue here about the power and influence of women's movements, which I think um, needs to be addressed and is particularly acute when there isn't enough funding available. Um, how am I doing for time? Doing fine. So if women's needs are not uh, addressed, there is another issue which I think um, we need to interrogate from a gender perspective. And that is that one of the effects of the design of these maternalist programs uh, is to deepen gender divisions of responsibility and care. Now the issue is not um, really subject to much analysis or recognition in the literature on CCTs, yet gender divisions of labor and responsibility are, as Nancy has said and has written many times, they're associated universally Just get on to it. <laughs> Are they timing us out or what? <laughs> um, shall we try this one? Is it the microphone? Shall we try this one now? Yeah, so, yeah, they're worn out. <laughs> All right, so, are we there? Can we hear? Can you hear me? Is it on? Is it on now? No? Oh. What about this one? That's oh, it might start up again. Yes, it might start to. I turned my off. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. 
Well, so this question, is, is it on yet? This question of um, maternalism and motherhood and the fact that motherhood is associated with um, all kinds of uh, forms of non-recognition and, and these asymmetries do have negative effects, these gender asymmetries, on the capacity of women to actually function on equal terms in the areas where they have to compete for resources. But it isn't really um, much analysed in the CCT literature. Women's receipt of the transfers, um, of course, reinforces their normative roles and responsibilities. Um, so that insofar as they benefit from the programmes, I think one has to say they benefit, uh, as it were, within existing social relations, ones which, through, uh, ones which are quite disempowering for women, in fact. And that's, that's actually a very interesting part of the discussion which really needs to be thought about, uh, partly because I think you know, motherhood is not made much safer by the work of these programmes, and yet it is uh, given so much um, additional responsibility, and indeed it is reinforced by these programmes. The whole idea of the identity of the mother is absolutely critical. So women acquire more recognition as mothers, uh, along with more responsibility, but they don't really acquire any more power or any more autonomy uh, in these programs, and therefore uh, they also don't acquire anything in the way of further rights. And I think that's another issue that has been taken up in some of the women's movements. Where are the rights of these mothers? It is nonetheless true that um, Women are very satisfied with uh, the fact that these programs do appear to dignify motherhood, do, do appear to uh, uh, give motherhood more status. And indeed, perhaps this is to do with the degree of female altruism um, that uh, pervades quite a lot, particularly of Latin American society, where women routinely speak of sacrificing themselves for their children. And there is a kind of, um, that seems to be a very common saying, actually. And you interview women, they say, yes, I'm sacrificed myself for my children. And yet they don't seem to have much sense of what their own objectives, their own desires, or their own goals are. It's a, it is a sort of somewhat self-abnegating kind of construct. But it is nonetheless interesting that self-esteem for these women is given meaning if understood as the way that the program locates them in terms of giving them satisfaction um, through publicly affirming their uh, role as mothers, if you like, their social identity as mothers. So this satisfaction, of course, is relative because you know women also complain about the duties that are imposed upon them, about the fact that the services are no good, the fact that they don't uh, feel they're getting um, proper treatment uh, from officials, and that came out as a very, very powerful um, complaint from a lot of the women, that there was a lot of racism in the delivery of the program and so on and so forth. So again, these multiple uh, problems um, in terms of the shortcomings of the program that simply don't get addressed. So we can see that cash transfers can be commended for having alleviated extreme poverty and in particular for improving children's health. And these are important and welcome developments. Children's education too has in certainly increased and the gender gap between girls and boys has um, been eliminated and that's another important um, uh, gain. But um, these micro-targeted programs um, do in the end operate with a highly selective definition of social need and their success in tackling poverty is therefore very partial. I think we need to think more about that hidden element underlying the success of CCTs, which is um, the unacknowledged dependency on women's care work, uh, as well as their contribution in the form of unpaid labor to the program. Women's availability um, to con you know, carry out this work, their involvement in household survival, um, and their involvement in community work, which is also required of them very often in these programs, and their very precarious relationship to the wage economy. It's those things that make them available for this purpose. And this availability um, to perform this role is taken for granted in these programs. And it is by confirming these conditions that these programs ultimately fail women, in my view. Highly unequal gender relations, maternal identities, and ideologies in combination with the specific conditions of female poverty are then perversely uh, central to 
uh, the functioning of these programs. So gender-blind policies then can run the risk of increasing women's vulnerability uh, at a time when the direction of public policy um, is uh, delivering shrinking livelihoods, poor if any work opportunities, and a social security system in which women lack pensions and entitlements in their own rights. And CCTs, of course, do nothing to offset those problems. So after decades of doing gender, prevailing policy assumptions still tend to naturalize women's roles, seek to make use of them, and uh, try to influence how women are, um, as it were, managed subjectively and situationally. So I think what um, we can conclude from this kind of um, research is that really women do need a reliable and autonomous income source, and women and households need roots out of poverty. Uh, they need um, challenge, to challenge some of these structures, and also there needs to be some more thinking around um, why women are positioned in that role. And we need programs that offer much more realistic and imaginative um, solutions to women's poverty than the maternalist options that are currently on offer. So it is my hope that um, Sylvia's handbook, um, uh, being there on all the uh, shelves of policymakers, uh, may now uh, tell us you know, that uh, they have no excuse any more to ignore um, the link between gender and poverty or the specific forms that it takes. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic. Okay, we have um, some time for questions. Um, uh, if you would like to ask a question, can you please raise your hand and if I don't see you, sort of wave it about. Uh, what we'll probably do is take um, questions in groups of three. When you um, uh, ask a question, question, could you kindly state your name and your affiliation um, and uh, then ask your question? Over there. No, behind you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. First, I would like to thank you very much to all the panelists. My name is Alexandra. I'm in Sylvia's class on gender and development. Um, my question would uh, mostly be for uh, Mrs. Molineux uh, about the Indian region. Uh, I, I feel that most of the time why policies do f uh, fail to uh, be transformative for uh, gender relations the region is that we forget to ask the why question on why uh, women do not uh, participate in the economy in the same way as, uh, as men. So why don't they use the resources uh, in the same way as men can do? And there, are, there has been a lot of uh, work on patriarchy and that, that kind of concept, but not much on complementarity in Winton household. And I know that in the Indian uh, region, there's a lot of uh, well, the absence of conflict in within a household doesn't mean that uh, there's a harmonious way of uh, consuming resources or having a, the right uh, to decide how to use them. So I was wondering how, how do you think policy can address this issue of complementarity that is highly invisible because not very conflictive, but still that has a lot of impact for women in how they can use uh, resources. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, it is a very interesting issue, isn't it? Because within indigenous communities, there is um, still a, as you say, a kind of ideology of complementarity. But how does it get addressed? Uh, it doesn't get addressed so much in policy, but it is increasingly being addressed uh, by indigenous women's movements who are saying that it really is not that complementary and uh, let, us, let us sort of not live with this mythology. 
Um, and I think it's that, that interrogation of that uh, idea coming from the grassroots and from the women's movements uh, is, has been very valuable. And I think also some scholars like Mercedes Prieto has done a lot of research looking at the non-complementarity of uh, uh, the divisions of labor in uh, the Andean region. And indeed, it's, it's withering away a bit as a concept. It's becoming more politicized and, and it's becoming within certain groups um, who want to kind of argue for a sort of uh, essential Andeanness? Uh, there is there is that going on, but at the same time, that is being challenged by um, by some indigenous women's groups. So it's an issue of contention. But certainly, the evidence shows that complementarity it ain't. Uh, and indeed, uh, as for harmony, I'm afraid there are very high levels of violence uh, against women in that region. Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say well done, Sylvia, from um, <laughs> Victoria Terrace, who are all here. Thank you for raising the level of our street intellectually. <laughs> and um, thank you for um, setting a good example, especially to the sort of young girls in the street, because it's nice to, to, to have a sort of positive image for them. But my question, maybe it's not really um, as intellectual as, as your sort of comments, but it strikes me that there's this sort of element of surprise coming from the stage. You know, why is this happening? Oh dear. You know, did you miss the fact this, this is planned? This is what they want. You know, this is what our government has planned. They want women in the home looking after the sick or children because it's free and they don't want to pay for it. It's simple. And <laughs> it is really. <laughs> And it, what really saddens me, I mean, to make a sort of political comment, is that there's no opposition. No one said, I agree with social services. I want to look after old people or sick people or, you know, disabled people or whatever. Because what are we going to do with them otherwise? Throw them in the bin or throw <laughs> them in the sea? It, you know, there, there isn't another solution, but it's all about money and it's all about the distribution of wealth. And why has no one said, hey, let's get the troops out of Iraq. We lost the war a long time ago, probably about two years ago. Let's get the troops out and hey, let's pay for our social services because we need this. Otherwise, what kind of society are we? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we can all have it. Good point, but it's certainly one we recognize in the women's budget group and in the uh, response that we produced for the emergency budget in June and to the spending review, we pointed out that if we didn't, if the government didn't insist on renewing the nuclear capability in the uh, Trident nuclear capability in the submarines, there would be enough money uh, to pay for social care. There would be enough money uh, to fund a lot of the things that they're cutting now. So that's why I make the point there are alternatives, but I think actually I see angers growing now as people begin to see in their localities what's really happening. It's no longer kind of an abstract numbers that's being announced by the government. It's actually <coughs> happening with short start centers being reduced or closed, with meals on wheels services being withdrawn, um, with libraries being closed. And I, I see, I don't live in London, but I see in my locality the the anger is, uh, is certainly developing. Thank you. Nancy, do you want to, to talk? Well, I'll, I, I'll agree with Diane. I, I happened to be in uh, Madison, Wisconsin uh, three weeks ago where uh, the state governor, Republican governor, has basically uh, just in the last couple of days succeeded in, in smashing public sector bargaining but it created a tremendous opposition. The state capitol was virtually occupied for three weeks. And it, I feel like it, it's in some ways turned the tide of public opinion in, in the US that, that, that the news cycle, uh, you know, sometimes we think of the media as um, uh, is, 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 well, Yes, but I think so, uh, often we think that the media is mirroring, you know, what is going on out there, and therefore if we don't see anything going on in the mirror, nothing must be happening. But what I really witnessed with the, the tremendous activism in, in the state capital was just the opposite, which was that the media paid no attention to the public sector issue until people 
actually took action themselves and really created, uh, they created, you know, the, the people, the students, the union members and the community activists who took over the state capital kind of uh, um, uh, created a kind of news event that finally got people to focus very effectively on the larger discussion. And I, so I'm hopeful that that will um, happen elsewhere and become a kind of self-reproducing, you know, self-amplifying movement. Thank you very much, Nancy. Further questions? Yes, there's one up there and one here and one here. And one there, sorry, as well. And there's, but there's only two of you up, up so you have to take <laughs> I'm Liz Dore from the University of Southampton. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for very interesting and great presentations, and congratulations, Sylvia, on your book. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, I was a little um, sort of there was quite a bit of mentioning of women's movements, but I'm not sure I see women's movements around very much anymore. Um, I think there's, from if, anyway, from where I'm looking, which might be from the wrong place, there's been a massive decline in women's movements. There's been, you know, writing about women, some feminist writing about women, but women's movements as such, I don't see around very much. So I was wondering if you'd like to comment on that in your particular areas, on gender budgeting, on uh, caring, and Maxine, in your study of the cash transfers. Can I respond to that now? I think we can mm -hmm. take another question. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually been, I, I think there's a, a growing, certainly in the UK, um, Maybe it's the cuts that's, 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 that's helping to foster this, but I was speaking about the similar issues to what I've spoken about tonight in London one wet Saturday about three weeks ago in what's called a feminar. Uh, for the, uh, <laughs> feminar for the, for the London uh, uh, Famnet. And I was very happy to see there weren't just old ladies like me there. There were a whole... Uh, younger generation of, uh, of uh, young women who were very keen to know more about this and even some came up to me after and said and how can we learn more about feminist economics and and uh, and and how can we sort of get to and then they were making plans for there's a women against the cuts organization that was uh, mobilizing and they talked a little bit about what they were doing so um i'm i'm perhaps a little bit more hopeful that, that things will move forward I think there is actually a very good explanation of um, uh, some decline in the uh, force of the women's movement, at least in, in uh, I'll speak for the case of the United States. Uh, income inequality is, is really intensified, and inequality among women has intensified along with it. And I think we've really, uh, we're now living through a period in which partly as a result of increases in women's labor force participation and movement into professional managerial jobs, there are bigger economic differences among women than there have been in the past. And that's made it hard in the US, for instance, to unify them around uh, uh, issues other than reproductive rights. But I think the economic crisis is changing that. And uh, I think what we're seeing with prolonged unemployment and a kind of loss in jobs in the middle sector, middle part of the economy, um, not just at the bottom, is a, 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 a kind of uh, realignment and reconfiguration. So um, I, I, think, um, I think we need to keep our eyes open for it, and I think we also need to really try to make it happen. I, I agree with the, um, the point about um, there is something going on which is very encouraging that Diane made and um, I was giving a talk about violence against women a couple of weeks back and there were these women from a, an organization called Feminista which has been having very large turnouts uh, at, at conferences, you know, 400 people in the, the recent ones. So there is something going on which is new and is very welcome and I think uh, the other point I would make is that um, there are new actors, uh, indeed, sort of coming forward who are becoming active in new ways. And I think I mentioned just now 
when I was speaking, um, the indigenous movements in uh, Latin America who include, you know, quite active women's movements. And I think that what you're seeing is a kind of female activism. I mean, women are getting active. I mean, they may not be in women's movements only, they may be in environmental movements, they may be in all sorts of other zones and areas, but there are, you know, there are, look at what happened in the Middle East. I mean, women were erupting onto the streets. And, you know, that, that, is, that is very, very significant. I mean, and I, I think that's, that we're seeing those processes which are quite encouraging for all sorts of reasons, you know, some of which are very sad and, and, and worrying, but uh, there, is, there is really a much more kind of active presence of women, I think, than there has been in recent years when there was that kind of, that decline of, of activism. Hi, Joey, um, LSE Sociology. Um, I, I'm actually quite interested in this discussion around um, uh, economic crisis and financial austerity, and, and I don't think it's coincidental that um, at these particular historical moments, um, we talked a little bit about the feminizing of the welfare state, how the welfare state is also often racialized as well, and so Reagan's kind of images in the 80s of black welfare mothers spending their money is on Cadillacs, and perhaps now a more contemporary mo um, you know, moment of uh, multiculturalism being dead everywhere, apparently. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the work that's being done, or if there's any work being done around uh, feminine bodies that are especially marked <clears throat> as less valuable to the state, particularly because of their race. And, and how racial and gender disparities kind of intersect in various places to form really, really deep inequalities um, um, in various uh, societies. So I don't know if you have any examples of work being done on that or kind of conversations and discourses going on about that stuff. I think uh, there's, a, uh, there's a little bit of uh, discussion in the US about how the language of the welfare reform debate, very racialized and very genderized rhetoric, has now been deployed against public sector workers. So um, in, the, in the US at least, uh, state and local employment, uh, uh, women of color are very overrepresented and there's a, a lot of discussion of how that has increased uh, the difficulty of mobilizing opposition to uh, to those cuts. Um, again, I think that I guess I'm somewhat hopeful that the as the scale of cuts continues, some of those obstacles to creating a more unified response will be overcome. Thanks. Uh, I think well, uh, in in the work in the Women's Budget Group, we try to look at some of the you know the the issues of intersection of multiple forms of disadvantage and figure out you know, which of these particular cuts is going to um, be particularly bad uh, for um, uh, um, uh, black and ethnic minority uh, women uh, in the UK. The, the housing benefit cut, for instance, is likely to be particularly uh, bad, particularly in London where housing costs are, are so high. Uh, and I, I guess that's... The, the, the way we've, we've tried to approach um, this issue of um, the, the fact that the, 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 the cuts will you know, affect all low-income uh, women, but they may affect black and minority low-income women e e even harder. So we, we try to look at that a little bit. Um, there is some very interesting work done on um, poverty relief, uh, both historically and um, contemporarily in, in the Latin American region by feminist um, analysts working with indigenous women. I mean, to show how many of these programs are rolled out and have been since the 20s and 30s, have a very strong kind of disciplinary element to them, that they're, they're sort of almost social hygiene uh, element, uh, cleaning up the women, and it came out with a lot in, in, in our research in the Andes and how, res, how much the kind of beneficiaries resented that attitude, um, that somehow they had to be kind of cleaned up and tidied up and, you know, they had to, they were talked about as being dirty and scruffy. So there's a lot of, a lot of racism involved in the kind of the way that these um, programs were delivered in these the particular regions that we were looking at. But it's also um, confirmed by the research um, from Mexico. So there is, there is research there, but it goes again back to 
um, attitudes that were prevalent in the 20s and 30s. So it's a kind of long-standing sort of um, trope within sort of anti-poverty programs in the region. Right, I can see a question up there. Um, <coughs> Oh, hello, my name is Berenice and I'm from Anglia Roskin University and I, I actually would like to follow up to the previous comments and questions on sorry, on the, on the research uh, in this uh, conditional cash transfers in the engine region because my, my concern has been on how the education that is given through the health centers or in the schools to the children and to the mothers where recipients are of indigenous ethnicity the information that is given to them is exactly that, that you have to forget everything that you do. Your parents have been wrong. You shouldn't do what your parents are, have been doing this time. It's like eliminating all, those, all that knowledge through that has come through the social reproduction in, in different ethnic groups. And, in, and for example, my, uh, in Mexico, there is different ethnic groups. And the information and the knowledge that they have passed uh, through generations is being tried to in being influenced through the education, supposedly, about, for example, as, as you just mentioned, Maxine, that hygiene, that women have to be clean. In, the, in the, the school teachers tell the children, you shouldn't be like your parents. That kind of information is, 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 is very contradictory to, to the message that uh, empowerment should be, and, and is kind of blind and exclusive, ex also is, is excluding the knowledge from indigenous people and the values that they have, et cetera. So I, do, I wonder if you find also information like that and experiences from, from the recipients, not only from the mothers, but also the children and how uh, the different implementers have affected that. Thank you. Um, hi, thank you for today. And thank you for publishing such a great book. My name is Adiza Tajani, and I run an international development blog. And I wanted to ask how, um, how can traditional and new media be best leveraged to help increase the understanding of gender and development? This is great. There's a question in the middle there, and then one in the, the second, the further. Hello. Uh, thank you for your talks. I'm Alice Evans here at the LSE. Um, thinking about your talks, it seemed that the common theme was that care work and poor women are used to reproduce the labor force, to create human capital for the next generation, and to cut the deficit. And this was raised as a concern. And thinking politically, how are we going to change this? Um, Nancy, you suggested we needed more research on inter-family inter resource flows. But is more research actually going to change any of this? So I was just sort of wondering, how can research make a difference to injustice? Okay, um, I just wanted to ask a question about gender mainstreaming and gender and development. It seems that only women of a certain class can reap the benefits of gender mainstreaming policy and that women mainly in rural areas or the poorest of women in developing countries aren't being empowered by movements to give them economic and political power. Um, for example, in Rwanda, you have a female majority in parliament, the highest in the world, yet so many women in rural regions um, just are having a lack of access to food in their own homes. They have high rates of domestic violence, which have increased since the genocide, et cetera. So I just wanted to ask how that can be properly addressed, other than you know the will of Western feminists, et cetera. Okay, thank you very much for those um, great questions. So I'm going to, we've got five minutes left. We have to go out of here by eight o'clock um, and move along to the reception. So there will be an opportunity to not only talk with our panelists, but also several contributors to the handbook who have identified by their badges. Um, so, um, you know, we don't need to stop the discussion exactly as we leave this theatre. But uh, if you'd like to start, Diane, would you like to start? Shall I, shall I start with the, that challenging question about how can research make a difference to <laughs> injustice? Very appropriate question, I think, to consider at the LSE. And, uh, <laughs> and it is a challenge for us all, and, uh, and I, which I hope, you know, all the people here who were students and who were, uh, who were researchers, who were academics, 
will also take up. I think one one important area is keeping alive the idea there are alternatives, yeah. and it, it is feasible to move towards alternatives, uh, but that you need um, some kind of collective uh, organization and, and action to do that. I mean, how that plays out and exactly how you do that is going to be very different in different times and places and the particular kinds of injustice um, that you, you want to address. You need good research and then you need to have it um, communicated in ways that people can understand. I thought Nancy's uh, slides was a great uh, example of that. And then you need some kind of collective uh, organization, I think, to uh, see how, how, it can, how it can make a difference. But good research by itself is never enough, I think. You also always also need um, you know, various strategies of mobilization to, to, to use it. agenda uh, has been incredibly important in um, helping uh, dis disenfranchise subaltern groups make claims and also to internalize kind of the notion that they are worthy of respect and, and this has to be uh, much more kind of taken up as you know something that people are trained I mean the people who work in these programs must be trained in these ideas so that they learn how to respect people mechanisms of accountability so that uh, people have a right to complain and have a right to, um, to, to say I will not be treated like that. So I think that the, um, the rights agenda has certainly been very, very important in, for um, vulnerable and poor women. I remember very um, clearly one woman who was interviewed some while back saying, I now know that I, am, I have the right not to be beaten. And actually that, is, that seemed to sum up um, something quite important about what we have to think about there are available to uh, press for uh, much more justice and fair treatment. I'm just going to can you all hear me with this actually I just want to add that I'm sorry there's not going to be time to answer those two other very important questions new media might actually be one way of actually communicating messages more effectively and uh, in response to the other question that was asked about gender mainstreaming and why gender strategies don't reach women at the grassroots um, again new media might be one way uh, in, which the, in, in which that could be advanced. But if you don't consult people at the grassroots in the first place, then you're never really going to get any representation, I think, at higher levels. So on that note, I would like to thank my speakers uh, for um, their wonderful um, uh, contributions tonight and to join everyone in a round of applause, please. <laughs>